Hello, uh, Dean Burnett here, this guy. Um, write the guy, author, uh, neuroscientist, science board, commenter on things, uh, write books, those ones, and more. Um, well, two more, there's two you can see there. And yeah, so this is my first in a probably quite erratic uh, series of video diaries. Uh, I'm doing this for several reasons. Uh, one, it's lockdown again, or semi-lockdown, or quasi-lockdown, or we're going from one lockdown to another. I don't know, I've lost track completely, so don't get to see a lot of people. And seeing as you know, for two years now, I've spent most of my day in well, this wooden box. Uh, it's my outdoor office. Uh, sort of becoming a little bit worried that uh, I started talking to myself. And I thought, well, if I record it and put it out, it doesn't count as to myself, does it? It um, counts as a conversation, albeit rather one-sided. So I don't really need medical intervention just yet. <clears throat> That's an encouragement. And also, i got a new book coming out in a month's time. And uh, with that, I've got a lot of talks lined up. But because of the aforementioned lockdown, they are online talks, which involves me staying at the camera a lot and talking out loud to what ostensibly is no one in the tangible sense. So I thought, oh, I'd better practice doing that because you know, I want people to take me seriously. And if I'm bad at that, then they won't. Fair enough, I think. So I thought I'd do, some, do this to try and get, get me used to the whole format that we're all getting used to slowly now. Uh, so yeah, so it's January 4th. I, have, uh, I haven't had anything to drink this year yet. Uh, probably will at some point, but uh, probably not for January, doing the dry January thing. Also, on me, uh, trying to exercise more, get a bit healthier. Not because I have any particular, you know, um, <clears throat> neuroses or concern about my appearance. I am, after all, a straight, white, middle, coming towards middle age, uh, scientist, man who's married with kids and stuff. So nobody cares what I look like. No one's ever cared, as far as I'm aware. And that took me wrong. It's a very privileged position to be in. It's far more relaxing than the alternative. But, you know, I've never really had much you know, beyond general acceptable presentation as social norms dictate. And also, like, I'd rather not look too bad. Like, if I had left the house and had three extra eyes and I was oozing green stuff, I'm sure people look at me and say, are you all right, at the very least? Because, you know, obviously I wouldn't be. But no, I'm trying to <clears throat> just get a bit, uh, in a bit better shape, um, largely because uh, of the festive period we introduced my eight-year-old son to uh, Spider-Man, Into the Spider-Verse, one of the better spider uh, superhero films, I think, perhaps one of the best, uh, perhaps the best. I don't know. Your mileage may vary. Uh, but uh, I got uh, away the jumper a lot and <laughs> recently walking out to the office to do some work and he said, Daddy, you look like Kingpin from Spider-Verse. You know, And I wasn't doing that, but I thought I'd do that to emphasise. And um, I, I don't know what, as I like to think I'm not superficial, but that isn't a look I'm going for. So I thought, you know, maybe I should try and become a bit more streamlined. <laughs> I think I've got the opportunity now. Um, yeah, so, you know, done a bit of exercise, already regretting it terribly, because uh, it's painful and dull. But, you know, we stick at it and stuff. But um, other things happened. I've uh, been kind of... Uh, vaguely rated uh thinking about looks and how i look and how people look a lot lately because uh this image of uh boris johnson has been doing the rounds so it's him in a lab uh looking at uh, a vial of what's this it's probably just saline uh looking like a scientist essentially looking like he's doing science i did a big twitter thread about this about my experiences and my concerns with this approach i'll put a link to it in the um description and that is it's something I've just always been a bit bothered about. But it's becoming more common, I think, at the moment. You see, or so Ivanka Trump doing it lately because of the pandemic, because of the coronavirus and all the efforts to tackle it, um, which are good, obviously. Uh, but and I think now, more than ever, that's a, perhaps a, a harmful thing, a potentially dangerous thing, because it's a shorthand. I know that. I know it's just like a, <clears throat> it's a shorthand where the media say, this is what science looks like. And you know, I, I benefited from that because I would argue I'm not the most credible scientist by any stretch of imagination. So you're not the best one. I have tales about that, which I'll share later on if this keeps going as a thing. But, you know, I look like one. I've always looked like a scientist. You know, when I was 12, I looked sort of like this, um, slightly more here, slightly. Uh, but, you know, people just assumed I'm a scientist. Oh, he must be. Look at him. He's a scientist. And that's not good. I shouldn't be given instant credibility like that. Uh, you know, I should earn it. I've tried to earn it. I'm still trying. But, you know, that's 
that's how it should work. And, you know, but then it's a shorthand. Like I say, it's a cliche, it's a stereotype, call it what you will. But according to most of the mainstream media, scientists look like people in white coats wearing safety goggles a lot of the time, looking at, intently at, you know, bubbling liquids or test tubes full of stuff, maybe holding something over a Bunsen burner, maybe in the blue glow of something, which is quite technical. And it's not just scientists, lots of people have this, you know, programmers, they're always, saying, like, they're always looking at the... Uh, the black screen with green text and it just typing away that's how programming works apparently even though it clearly doesn't and you know the so the media has a lot of these shortcuts and cliches and shorthand to just say this is a story about scientists science this is a thing this is what these people look like and i get where that came from you know you don't have time to sit down and explain to every single reader slash viewer what they actually look like what they do because you know 24 rolling news and constant scrabbling for clicks and coverage there's, there's no time for that and I, I've worked for a media institution I get that but this idea that all you need to show a scientist is lab coat staring at something technical rubber gloves maybe safety goggles that's kind of been used for ill a lot lately and the Boris Johnson example is what I'm thinking of in that we know based on his general behaviour his previous actions his decisions his views his temperament is <laughs> everything about him that Boris Johnson does not care about science maybe he respects it a bit but that doesn't let it affect doesn't let it affect his actions he clearly has no time for details no he's a very short attention span he's not a scientist he has you know he's barely on a nodding acquaintance with reality itself a lot of the time if it you know, unless it serves his purposes but then for the media to show this picture of him in a lab with a lab coat that infers on him a sort of low-level credibility amongst people who don't really think in these terms, which are plenty of people, and nor should they. They have other things to do. They have their own lives to live. But, yeah, so it just gives him this veneer of credibility that actual scientists have or crave, even. Maybe they don't get it that much. I don't. Um, well, apart from looking like this, but I, I don't... People don't look at me and think, oh, he's an expert in this, because... Um, or maybe they do. I don't know. I don't talk to anyone about what they think of me, because that's... That seems like a very <laughs> unpleasant path to walk down, and yeah. So, but you know, this idea that you can just show a politician in a, what lab coat and with gloves and hold up some bubbling substance, and then no, oh, they must know what they're talking about because they've done the science. So look, they they're invested in the science of it too, and it, they aren't clearly. It's just a photo op. It's just propaganda to show people that you know. Well, my decisions are informed by science. They're not your maybe you know, your your wardrobe is in this particular instance, but beyond that. You know, it's really not, it's unhelpful because we, we, we're not at a time now where we need scientific credibility and scientific experts and deference to what you know, what people who know better about these things think. And instead we've got some scruffy head buffoon in a lab coat trying to look serious. And, you know, I've been that guy and I, nobody should have <laughs> nobody should have listened to me at the time. So when it's the actual Prime Minister doing it, that's worse, you know, because people can and almost certainly will die as a result of this sort of surface level approach to scientific credibility rather than actually putting the work in. I um, don't know where I was going with that, but like I say, got nothing else to talk about. So I'm just talking out loud at you good people if you're listening to this or at the camera if nobody is. Doesn't matter. I had my fun. Um, yeah, so uh, just if you're still listening, uh, my next book, Psychological, is out in a month, a month exactly, January 4th today, uh, February 4th it comes out. It's all about mental health and stuff. I'll be doing lots more about that. Link in the description as ever. Um, yeah, so I'll do another one of these diaries when I can be bothered or when it's something to say. Maybe tomorrow, maybe in 10 minutes, maybe never again. Who knows? Let's see. Hello, uh, Ding here again, another video diary, because, because why not, I suppose. Another lockdown day, January 5th, no change in sight. I mean, I, I have left this room since we got last in one of these, but you wouldn't think of it. I mean, I just took my jumper off. I could have been wearing this underneath the whole time. So, yeah, uh, updates. Um, it's been working. It's been sat here working, really. Uh, I hit my arm. This one. When I do that, it hurts. And uh, no, typical doctor advice to say, well, stop doing that. So I will. I uh, don't know why uh, it hurts. I don't know what I've done. Um, so I've been trying to do some exercise and stuff, but I've been doing you know, nothing rigorous. Well, rigorous enough to make me break out into a sweat, you know, but if I stand up too fast, I do that. So that's not really enough to warrant an injury. Um, 
I think just my body's that old now. You know, it's got to the point where my nervous system f- feels the impact of something and then reacts maybe a day later and like, <laughs> sorry, what? Oh, God. Oh, oh my God. Something's gone wrong. Um, I mean, as a neuroscientist, I shouldn't really say that. Maybe it'll, people will believe that's the thing that happens. But it feels like that happens. You know, it actually does feel like your body just gets like, oh, I can't be bothered anymore. I feel like about my hair as well, because I often talk about going bald a lot. But I don't actually care. It's, that's an affectation for me. I actually, I've been going bald like this since I was 18, but then, then it just stopped. So if I do go bald eventually, I presume I will. It's fine. You know, I'm kind of used to it now, but I like to pretend I care. But I'm very hairy from like the ears down. My grandfather was one of those guys who shaved twice a day, and it's all loads down there. So um, I feel like you know, it's almost like hair comes from the center of your body. When I was younger, it was just coming out everywhere. But now it just gets here and goes. Oh, I can't be bothered. I'm just going to come out the ears. I think that's uh, what happens. Um, it is um, again. I'm a scientist. I shouldn't say stuff like this. Uh, this is only the second entry of uh, this sporadic diary thing I'm doing. Um, but I'd like to read uh, a comment from. Uh, Idiot Brain, my first ever book, the very first le- line in the introduction. Um, this book begins the same way nearly all my social interactions do, with a series of detailed and thorough apologies. Uh, so I should apologise for the last uh, video I did yesterday, because I sort of a bit inconsistent. I put it in the t- titles, and um, I said, in the start I said, you know, like I people say, look at me and think I'm a scientist immediately, so I get instant credibility. And later on I said, I never get credibility. So those are inconsistent things. But what I meant was, well, it's what I think I meant was I am um, I look like a scientist so people find it credible for me to say I'm a scientist but am I a credible scientist that's not the same thing I've had to work to the point where people actually take me seriously as one um, it's a very nuanced <laughs> sort of difference but it made sense to me in my head but you know I'm happy to apologize for it and uh, that's what's been the highlight of my day I suppose it's the uh, the story about the um, I'll put up on the screen now as well yeah, uh, well, it's in the metro. Let me just uh, read out the first part. Um, Tory said a and was full of fat mums in pot noodle stained leggings. In a New Year's Eve message on Twitter, Gareth Bain suggested that a and departments were full of fat mums in pot noodle stained leggings with their snot-covered Asbo children. Uh, nice, very nice thing to say when you're a you know, political figure. And that's, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't be par for the course, but it is these days. People just say stuff like this out loud all the time. For me, it was the apology he didn't make later. Um, Mr. Mr. Bain said in a statement, whilst I feel my comments have been taken out of context, uh, I do offer my sincere apologies for any offence they may have caused. Double whammy of weasel apologies. I was actually quite impressed by that. By that. Um, it was taken out of context, uh, which, um, as many people say, begs the question, what, what was the context? What was the context where saying that out loud in public was you know, an acceptable thing to do? Best I can think of is he was like secretly rehearsing for his role as the villain in a weirdly topical pantomime, uh, which seems unlikely given how you know all theatres are shut down right now. So yeah, I don't see what context there is which would justify that. And also the whole um, "I'm sorry if you were offended" thing, genuine bugbear of mine. It's like I did nothing wrong, but you reacted wrongly to it, and I regret that happening. Uh, which is such a weasley way. Just because you have the word "sorry" in it doesn't mean you're apologizing like if someone says my dog got run over i'll say i'm sorry about that i'm not saying i did it i'm just saying i'm sorry on your behalf that this bad thing happened but if i did run him over and say um sorry your dog you lost your dog that would not be an apology that would be me avoiding apologizing and i don't get why it's so hard really honestly it's been a real baffling part i'm not saying i'm some sort of superhuman a virtuous man, but I, I genuinely find it more stressful not apologising when I'm blatantly wrong about something. I did on Twitter a while ago, like I, I got it's a miscommunication. I thought someone hadn't asked me to use my the stuff in an article, and the article came out, and I was like, rah, 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 "How dare you! I will, I do know who I am." Um, I didn't say that. I would never say that, except in jest. I did say it once, when someone came up to me after a gig and said, "How did you? How did they book you here?" And my words are, "Do, do you know who I am?" As in. Are you aware of my existence before this? Which was a surprise to me. So it was the it's almost like the anti, do you know who I am? But I digress. Um, yeah, so then I realised, oh no, wait, I screwed up there. So I deleted my angry rant and did a Twitter apology saying, yeah, that was me, really messed that up. Because the idea of knowing I'm wrong and you know, publicly, when I've like made, a, made a fool of myself and you know, pretending that didn't happen or insisting I'm right, 
seems like so much more stressful in existence and i don't i don't get why people just dig their heels in and like no 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 all the facts are wrong i am actually correct that that just seems so anxiety inducing in existence and it's actually come up a lot today in that you know the bbc have been flagged up and condemned rightly i think uh, for giving airtime to the scientists who say covid isn't even that bad and you know these restrictions are unnecessary and herd immunity is fine and like just going against all the available evidence all the many many deaths and which include my own father and that was you know it's always a real kick in the soul to hear someone say covid isn't even that bad when you've lost someone very close to you for no reason and yeah, so like people are wondering, are these are actual scientists. How can they insist on, you know, they're right when all the available evidence says that they're wrong? And it's it's a really weird phenomenon, isn't it? In that someone, like, has been so invested in their own opinion and so committed to, you know, this persona of themselves as someone who is correct about this thing. It, it becomes sort of second nature, comes ingrained, almost comes subconscious. Uh, I wrote articles about this, so I'll put them in the, um, in the description if, if anyone's interested. And you know, it's also something I sort of realised in that I'm sort of kind of lucky in that when I first started being a prominent scientist, um, if you think of me as prominent now, your mileage may vary, as I say. I am, um, you know, I was kind of worried, thinking, am, am I allowed to write books, write articles, so I'm not quote unquote a proper scientist? You know, I've got my name on a few papers, never as first author in scientific circles. I was not a credible scientist, you know, incredible enough to to get away with it, like I go back to last week and then it was allowed to be there but I wasn't like you know there was no Burnett model of this in the scientific world or if there is it's not me someone else uh, so like I was never like a high profile scientist never you know talk of the town like you know, a prominent name in the field so I thought oh, am I just like you know, an imposter or am I like jumping the queue by getting to write stuff as a scientist when I've got not got like this whole celebrated body of work behind me but these days, I think that's actually given me more of an advantage because I don't have anything to defend. If you're a scientist who has worked their way up rightly, successfully, with diligence and hard work and stuff, you have a body of work uh, to support you. In this is my work. This is why I'm prominent. Why I'm famous. And then, you know, someone comes along and says, "Actually, all that is wrong." That's devastating. You know, that's actually really quite. You know, that's a massive threat to you, your identity, your whole career, your ethos. You know your body of work and yeah you know, emotionally instinctively you will dig your heels in and say no that this counter evidence must be wrong and so you know i can sort of see how it happens uh it's just that you know when people do that when they have their own views and beliefs which completely contradict the ever-increasing evidence and death toll you shouldn't put them on the radio as in like what what do we get from that and then knowing that don't oh, apart from telling people other people don't agree with this, you know. I don't care. Other people think the moon's made of cheese. Other people think the world is flat. I don't care what they think. They're wrong. We know they are. And, oh, I'm going to get comments now, aren't I? Well, at least, at least it's some engagement. And it counts as, counts as interaction. When you're stuck in a box all day, that'll do. I'll take it. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, if I've ever been wrong about something that you're aware of, sorry, genuinely, that was my bad. And, you know, it's not hard to say that. And I'll say it again at some point, probably tomorrow. Hey, uh, Dean again, Dean's video diary, just talking to the camera. Someone watches it, fine, they don't. Still a thing that happened. Uh, I don't normally wear a hat when I do this, but today is special because um, cause I am. Uh, two reasons. Uh, one, uh, well, if you look at my, my YouTube channel, this is me sat here looking like this, they're all exactly the same. So I thought I'd mix it up with a, I don't know, attire, uh, accessories. That's the word, isn't it? And also, um, it's got a bit darker now before I film this. I normally film a bit earlier because uh, I'm outside. So you know, now I'm using my fluorescent light up there. And it sort of really makes my head glow. Look at that. And uh, you know, so I just cover that up, make it look a little bit more uh, human. Um, this, you know, this is my hat. I have three of these. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't normally buy this type of hat. I wouldn't normally buy any hat. But you know, when you go out in the sunshine, when it is when such things occur you need head protection especially when you've relatively bald and uh, but uh, i've got a massive skull it's a bonnet family trait apparently and um so yeah, very few hats fit me this one of the only ones that does marks and spencers i think uh discontinued now because of course 
Uh, yeah, so uh, today's been, again, just been sat here, writing stuff, replying to things, doing messages, doing my assignments, uh, deadlines, and so on and so on. It's been a weirdly nostalgic day uh, in terms of stuff that has happened. Uh, firstly, I got, uh, you know, someone tweeted me saying, because I did a big rant yesterday about the weird things I've done as part of radio interviews and stuff. So I'll link me to a tweet uh, about a guy saying, oh, he's a historian, <laughs> I'll, I'll link to it in the description, and uh, saying, like, yeah, this worst interview we had on radio was you had to debate the location of the Battle of Hastings, and he's a professional historian, and the other guy uh, came to him in a vision. And so, yes, I have made similar, shall we say, uh, uh, I've had similar experiences. Um, I was asked to go on BBC Wales after the Higgs boson was discovered to debate it, because, you know, it, it wasn't the thing. It was a matter of opinion, this massive scientific discovery, uh, with up against a moon landing denier and Stephen Allen Green from Christian Voice. Remember when he was a bad guy, uh, the main one in the country? Yeah, so Christian fundamentalist and a conspiracy theorist uh, against me, a neuroscientist, discussing one of the biggest physics findings of uh, you know modern times. I, I didn't do it. I didn't want to. I thought that would be uh, bad, uh, you know, distressful for me and pointless all around. Uh, but then it reminded me of, the t I think my favourite interview I did was on Five Live. I think it was Five Live. I won't swear to it. Can't find it online anyway. Uh, where I <laughs> talk about the Professor, Professor Canavero. Uh, you may remember him. He pops up every now and again. He's the guy who insists he could, you know, he's on the verge of doing a successful human head transplant, or like to think of it, a body transplant, because technically you go with the head. And uh, he, you know, he announced a few years back that uh, he'd done it, a successful head transplant, and it's meant to take like 16 hours, only took eight, like half the time. And it was in the Telegraph, it was a big story. Uh, no, like three paragraphs in there mentioned it was on cadavers. So, you know, like, how would you define successful in this case? And I was on Radio 5 Live talking about it because it's a brain-based story and they come to me for stuff like that. And uh, they kept saying, it, so, you know, isn't there a breakthrough? And I kept saying, no, no, it's not. And they said, you know, he did, uh, they, they were insistent, like he did a successful human head transplant you know, in eight hours. And I said it was on cadavers. I think my exact words were, give me five minutes on a staple gun and I'll give you the same result. And I haven't really been asked back since, but honestly, I think it was worth it. I'd happily do that again anytime. So yeah, like, it's... It's, you know, he, uh, Canavera kept insisting many, many times that human head transplant is Im imminent in the next 10 years, which is uh, sort of media maverick speak for, it's not going to happen, but it'll sound imminent. But by the time we get to that point, you'll have forgotten about it, so I won't have to say I'm wrong. Not that anyone does that anymore, as you, my video yesterday explained. But you know, he, he's definitely making it up, I will I would say. It's my own personal opinion, based on 20 years of neuroscience, that he's making unsustainable claims that... Uh, you can attach someone else's head onto someone else's body. That would involve, amongst other things, connected two separate spinal cords together on you know, the neck here. Like that's the way how you control the body, and that is beyond any known science, uh, neuroscientific or otherwise. And if he has perfected the technique to do that, uh, he should be a billionaire overnight if he announces that technology, because we don't know how to do that. Uh, like, you know, we can barely connect two damaged nerves from the same person, let alone two completely different spinal cords. Um, him claiming he's perfected this technique is like someone going on the news and saying, I have invented a coal fusion reactor, limitless energy for all mankind. And they say, oh, great, can you tell us how it works? And then they tell you how they've plumbed the toilets into the reactor for the technicians, and which is, which is an important part, but it's not really the, the main thing, is it? So yeah, so like, I'm very wary of that. So if he comes up again anytime soon, he's due. He's due another sort of resurgence. Uh, then, you know, rem remember what I said. But another thing that came up was uh, I did an article about why depression and dementia aren't mutually exclusive. You can't have two. Well, if it's me shambles, I'll put in the link again. And uh, this came about because of the recent documentary about Robin Williams and his final days and his you know, dealing with Lewy body dementia, arguably the worst dementia, if you know the stats behind it, and the symptoms. It's really, really horrific. And, you know, there's no way to sugarcoat that. But it's sort of, you know, even when... If that first came about, like there was a sort of weird, tiny little corner of the internet, which, oh, I have a certain history with the Robin Williams thing. Like I'm a professional writer now, and I know how much of a privilege it is to be able to say that. But you know, it's it's an immense privilege, and I'm very lucky. I know many people who would love to do what I do and be where I am. But I'm here partly because Robin Williams died the way he did. In that, I was writing for the Guardian at the time, 
and I, you know, I've told the story before, but I came into the office one morning, sat down, opened my laptop in August, and news had broken a few hours earlier that Robin Williams had died, you know, by suicide. Terrible, terrible news. And then, you know, it's been a few, out a few hours already because of the time zone differences. And uh, yeah, there's already the stuff like, you know, people say he must be in his depression because he was known to have that. You know, he had a lot of demons, as they call it. And also he was selfish, although more right wing pundits say, you know, it was so selfish to do that to you, your family and people who love you. And and I know it's not how it works. It isn't how depression works. It's not how it's, it's ever worked. You don't see things that way when you're in the grips of depression. So I did you know, that. I've seen that plenty of times because you know, it's not that uncommon for someone high profile to end their, end their own life and that's usually the reaction that happens that with Gary Speed a few years before the uh, the Welsh football manager former player I think I'm not into sport I don't know but uh, I, just, you know, I just sort of got a bit annoyed so I just fired off this quick blog my Guardian blog which I had at the time and put up there saying depression and suicide aren't selfish stop saying that and it was um, it was watch, it was read like sort of, Two million times in the space of two and a half days and it still remains my most popular piece of writing ever and you know it, at the time i was actually uh talking with publishers to potentially do a book because my blog was going well like i was becoming known as a writer but this so like there's millions of people reading this thing overnight and becoming well known like that really kicked things into much higher gear and i got my book deal put through and uh yeah, so here I am now. Uh, you know, would I be here where I am now if Robin Williams hadn't you know, died the way he did? Um, I don't know. I might have made it eventually. I was already you know, talking to publishers, but it would have been a slow progress, and maybe I would never have got as far as I did. So you know, it's, it's an argument to be said that I owe my position to Robin Williams and you know, the way the way he went, and that's not... It's bittersweet, isn't it? But yeah, so then it came out later on that he had Louis body dementia, but... Uh, yeah, so there's some people who seem to think that, ah, oh, well, he had dementia, so everything you said about depression is wrong. You can't apply it here. And I, well, you can quite easily. You know, depression is still a thing. It doesn't matter who has it. It's, it actually exists. And all the stuff I said about it is, I would still stand by. I mean, I nuance, more nuanced argument these days. This was like six years ago. But yeah, so it's it's been an odd one, sort of taking over old um, old memories and like old stuff like I've dealt with before. Like it just pop, seemed to pop up today. It seemed to be the day for it. And then someone retweeted one of my most popular tweets, just apropos, that was from six years ago too. It seems to be that, just something something about today seems to be uh, dragging up the past, I suppose. On a more positive note, I think I was talking with publishers at the time. Then I remembered uh, why one of the publishers, uh, I had a different book pitch from my first book pitch. Um, no one no one bought it because it wasn't a good pitch. You know, It was my first ever time doing one. But uh, one certain publisher, a big name uh, publisher, who has since published one of my books, so uh, <laughs> there's no um, no animosity there. No, it's very much water under the bridge. They they rejected my proposal, and for my favourite reason ever, they said we really like the idea for a book, but we've spoke to the marketing people, and they're not sure how we'd get it on the one show to promote it. So we're going to decline. Which I mean, you know, at the time I realised that's just them trying to fob me off in a nice way to say like you know, we don't want it but we don't want to upset you or tell you you're a bad writer we'd like to hear more from you in the future but it was such a <laughs> I mean it concocted conco this idea that this massive publishing house they choose their books based on the booking policy of the one show uh, which I don't know it doesn't seem like a sustainable business model for me uh, but I still haven't been on the one show uh, but you know I've been on Sunday Brunch that's the same thing isn't it um, yeah so I think one of the problems I have with these videos, I never know how to end them, so I'm just not gonna. Hi go. Hi go. I know what. Well, mixed up a bit. Brand new year, new me, all that, new words, new vocabulary, new language. Let's see how far I can take that. I'm already bored of it. Um, yeah, Dean's video diary again. Uh, already uh, any. <laughs> Any vague plans I had to do it daily have been ruined. I uh, did do it on Wednesday, uh, but then tried to upload it. And because uh, the time I was doing it, it was a bit late. And uh, the file sort of went weird. I transferred to a different computer, went all juddery. And I didn't realize that I uploaded it. So I took it down again. And then I sort of thought I'd do it again. And then, um, you know, Western democracy seemed to go into collapse. So, I thought, you know, people probably aren't interested in my ramblings right now. And I'm kind of distracted by that. So didn't bother but I put it up yesterday instead then of course I meant to record a video yesterday too and I didn't uh, because well 
Uh, yesterday my wife's at work and she works in a different city so she's away for most of the day so I was solo parenting and obviously lockdown, homeschooling, kind of distracting. <clears throat> Not only problem, I enjoy spending time with my kids. Like I've, I've been known in the past to have a bit of a uh, hostile uh, response to people saying, you know, babysitting, you? no, no, these are my children. I, nobody's paying me to do this. This is my responsibility as an adult and a father. And that shouldn't be a surprise, but it is to a lot of people. But uh, normally it's fine, but uh, the night before last, uh, my daughter, who's five, still has occasional, she's not so bad now, we've sort of got over the worst of it, tendency to just wake up in the night and come and find you, because, uh, you know, she's awake now, and therefore so should you be. And because my wife is working, she had the spare room, so she came to find me, and then I have to take her back to her room and sit with her while she goes back to sleep. But when she wakes up in the night, she she's sort of a bit like, you know, it's it's really important to get some sleep now. But uh, she's like one of those people who pulls up uh, the garage forecourt, fills a car full of petrol, and decides this is the perfect place to, uh, you know, uh, make some phone calls or have a three course meal, which I brought with me. It's not a chore; it's a day out. And you become more and more infuriated by the fact that um, you know this person is <laughs> delaying your logical progression. And yeah, so like I was up for three hours while she just sat there babbling, rolling around, talking out loud. And so I got about maybe two and a half hours sleep total. And it wasn't good. I wasn't in any fit state to communicate anything coherent yesterday. And I didn't. But I had to do all the, because I was distracted by the homeschooling stuff and, you know, stuff still happened. But it's a weird phenomenon because I, I it's happened, this isn't the first time it's happened, but it's the first time it's happened to me during this dry January period. I'm trying to be more healthy and active and get more sleep. And I have been getting more sleep because I haven't been staying up drinking wine or anything like that. So, Logically, I should be you know, more robust, more resilient to this, but I felt much worse than usual uh, because <clears throat> it's a well-known phenomenon. I've seen loads of web cartoons about it. I don't know anyone has this, that when you start getting more sleep, because all of us don't get enough sleep at some point these days, especially a parent or if you're working late or doom scrolling, as they call it. We just Our sleep is all over the place lately. So by and large, people don't get enough sleep. But a lot of people notice that when you finally do, finally get to, you know, if you go for long periods of not getting enough sleep and you finally get an early night, and have you, you know, you're allotted eight hours, and you wake up, you tend to feel more tired, more wrung out, more drained, and it's really odd, you know, I think, surely I've had more sleep, so I should be less tired. So like, I've eaten twice as much as normal, so why am I more hungry now? That doesn't make any sense. And I've, you know, I've often found this, <coughs> and I've, you know, <coughs> try that again. I've sort of wondered if, you know, my, my old theory was like, maybe, maybe just build up a bit of sleep momentum, you know, you just get more time to, sleep and therefore you, <laughs> your brain takes a little more time to, re, to reverse course and like, like stay in an oil tanker rather than a speedboat and you know there are lots of different options in that you know, sleep is a really complex process people just people just think it's like just shutting down it's not the body maybe but the brain's constantly wearing away and so i've often thought why, why does that happen why do we have why do we end up being more tired when we get more sleep i don't know if it, i haven't looked at the research but I'm, to speculate as the guy who's been doing neuroscience for 20 years i think you know, if anyone's going to it should be me i suppose um my you know, you know there's lots of things going on there when you sleep the brain's doing a lot of things it's like clearing away all the, the cellular debris the build the, the rubbish that builds up in the brain as it does its work during the day and that's all shunted away mostly during sleep so maybe if you're getting just by and just enough sleep you know you just tie up a little bit so you can function and you know when you get more sleep you know you your cellular processes are more cleared so your brain when you do wake up your brain's a bit more active or you, you know, your brain gets more it's all functioning better that's a well-known outcome of getting enough or more sleep over the long term and so therefore you know it's maybe it's like going up you know, to the next class in swimming like if you can swim two lengths you can be in like the first class but then you swim four and you can be in the second class but then you have to do at least four to stay in that class so you get pumped back down again you feel worse and um but pardon me, I, I suspect it might be because our sleep cycle is really complex in terms of how it's organized. It can be thrown off by most things, like uh, too much stimulation, just you know, too much caffeine at the wrong time. Daylight, that's why jet lag is a thing, that throws off our sleep. So it's really confusingly and intricately regulated by internal hormones, levels of light, uh, habits, you know, like what cycle body temperature, that's a big part of it too. So if you go for long periods without getting enough sleep, you... Um, you know, you, your brain just adjusts to that. It goes, well, this is what I've got. I'll, I'll, I'll work with this. And you sort of 
develop your sleep rhythms accordingly. Like I, you know, before the pandemic, the first last year, I sort of, um, or lockdown, sorry, I got to the point of staying up late, like 12, 1 o'clock and waking up about nine-ish. So that was the regularly, that was part of my brain was in that habit. So once I'd gone to bed earlier, it took me a while to get to sleep because like the brain's like, no, no, this isn't when you sleep. And also drinking as well, it sort of throws off your internal processes to, you know, because it's dealing with the alcohol as well, it throws off your sleep cycle. That's why alcoholic sleep is not as restful or as a re- re- restorative as proper sleep, not well, normal sleep without any alcohol in your system. But sleep cycle is, it takes place in four stages, non-REM one, two, and three, and then REM sleep. And I think it's non-REM one, two, like those are the ones that occur at the end of your sleep cycle where it's sort of, you know, it's easy to wake up now. It's oh, like, I've had my allotted sleep time. This is the part of, you know, my brain's in that state where like, oh, I can wake up now, because that's when I do that. So when you get more sleep, it's almost like I suspect your brain sort of, okay, so it's, you know, internally, it's 5 a.m. I've gone through my usual cycles. I can start another one. You can imagine, like, I get more sleep. But then your alarm goes off at the regular time or like you're the, the other part of your brain thinking, oh, this is time to wake up now. And you're right in the middle of an, an extra sleep cycle, like right in the REM, th- not REM, like three cycle. And it's like screeching to a halt. It's like, what the, you know, your brain leaves things half done. Your sleep is then, your sleep stage that you wake up in is incomplete so like there's all these loose ends flapping around and they're bringing us through a handbrake turn to like what wait, wait what, what's going on and that leaves you in a sort of fug state for the for a long time you know you wake up eventually i think everyone does but it's a lot harder to wake up uh part way through a sleep cycle uh, than it is to you know, at the end of uh, your, your regular ones which your brain's got in the habit of you don't get enough sleep so um yeah so that's i i suspect as a part of why getting more sleep um is it makes it harder to wake up it makes you tired when you wake up because it's not that you're getting more sleep it's not like a sort of you're just putting sand into a bucket it's stages when you get more maybe you don't get you get more than usual but you don't get sufficiently more for a whole other stage that'd be like an extra couple of hours maybe depends on how quickly you go through them so maybe you get one extra hour you're only halfway through and that leaves things incomplete like leaving a car half built or half you know half filled with petrol or like your, your bonnet's open and the work's being done then you have to drive off suddenly bits flying everywhere, like there's like, lots of noises coming out of it, the mechanics screaming for help underneath, that's what your brain is sort of doing, only, I'm going to say we're less screaming, but no, it, it, was, it was really, really exhausting yesterday. Mm-hmm.